the next speaker is uh, Art Kressner, 3G Systems of the Future. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, Amy and the folks from RICE, uh, thank you very much for organizing this event and in, uh, inviting me to participate. Um, I'd uh, uh, like to tell you this is the first opportunity we've had to present some of the work we've been doing in thinking about the smart grid and how we would implement it, what it really means on an operational level. Uh, it, uh, also, I, I want to tell you that uh, we didn't see the previous presentations before we prepared our presentation. And you're going to see uh, some of even the same words in the, in the presentation. So I, I kind of feel that uh, what we're, what's happening here is we're resonating. And uh, there's a lot of, of uh, synergies in this, and, and this is quite a diverse group. So I, I, I appreciate this opportunity to hear and also to present some of what we've been doing. Okay. First, this is a little disclaimer that our legal department says I have to, have to put up on the screen. Don't have to read it. Uh, the, um, the next item is, uh, is kind of an overview of what I'm going to present. Though I'm going to tailor this presentation a bit to, to, I think, what the subject and the interest might be of this group. If you want to uh, hear more about any of the slides as I zoom by them, uh, you could come by and, and we could uh, discuss that. Or you could give me a call or send me an email. All that information uh, will be available. <clears throat> We're going to briefly describe the way we deliver power today. Uh, we operate the most reliable uh, power delivery system uh, in the uh, United States, maybe in the world, we think. Uh, also, uh, we're going to be describing some of the challenges and what we envision the future to be. Uh, the future that we're going to be in and the future that hopefully some of the solutions that you folks come up with can help us. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about some international benchmarking. We're not alone. New York City is not, is not uh, it's unique in some aspects, but it's not the only place that is like it is. Uh, there are other places uh, we have to go pretty far and wide to, to find these uh, kind of uh, uh, commensurate kinds of, of places like in London and Paris, uh, but also in the U.S. and Chicago. And we're doing a lot of benchmarking to kind of uh, work together and study uh, what each of us have learned and what we're doing and what our, each of all of our thoughts are. And this is something new on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We're, we're looking to form technology alliances. This is something we'd like to, to offer to, uh, to the folks in this room. Uh, beyond uh, just a, a uh, relationship uh, or as a customer to order the commercial equipment, but to actually uh, contribute and, and participate and identify what our needs and what, what the solutions might be of the future. And I'm going to describe a couple of conceptual designs. These are things that, that, that we're uh, actually putting on the drawing boards. First, let's look at the past. And, and what made us change the last time. Uh, this was our first generation. Uh, the kind of the, uh, I, now I see what you mean by the fuzzy screen. Uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, a jumble of overhead wires that kind of, that was a, an indication that maybe we had reached the limits of scalability of that technology. And uh, you can see this uh, highlighted a bit even more dramatically uh, in, in this next slide, which shows what the underground looks like in that same period. And uh, what's, what's interesting, you see that slot, the picture in 2003, and it doesn't look much different. Well, we've just about reached the limits of capability and scalability of what we've got now. What, what is going to compel us to, to go to this next generation, what's going to compel us to go to the smart grid, is that we don't have a choice. It's not scalable much beyond where we are now. In fact, to give you a reference point, that uh, you know, we're, the smart grid's going to be coming in uh, two to three years or three to five years, that comment, it actually started last summer. And the, the operational... Uh, uh, sections of that is going to be in, in place by, by next summer. Uh, now, what are the design attributes? What are the practical kinds of, of requirements that we have uh, in, in the way we operate now? 
uh, as I mentioned, we're very reliable. The way we achieve reliability is by redundancy of equipment so that we can sustain any two, we have hard assets in the ground, so that we can sustain any level of combination of two contingencies and still maintain that peak demand on that peak day for those 10 hours that we experience maybe each year. With that level of, of redundancy, uh, uh, we're essentially overbuilding our system and we have 40% more assets, at least, for that peak moment. We have much more than 40% for all those other times. Uh, these uh, substations and facilities that we have require a great deal of real estate. And in, in the urban uh, setting, especially in New York City and other areas, this real estate is extremely expensive. And uh, in fact, it's, it, 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 it in many cases can't be bought. So we're faced with the constraint of, of the space that we need. We have to find more creative ways of, uh, of uh, being able to uh, build our facilities. We operate uh, at the, in a distribution system, uh, our, our uh, uh, again being hard wired, uh, networks can't be sh shut off incrementally. They are either all on or all off. So that the impact of an outage even uh, in one network could be very, very significant. And uh, the secondary, the connection, the low voltage system that's connected to many of, of our homes and businesses uh, cannot be controlled remotely. Rather inflexible, but uh, in, it's simple and it, it works, but very expensive. So these challenges again uh, we're, we're working in a very difficult real estate situation. Uh, the density of, of uh, energy use and the density of, of the, the uh, population in our, in our area is, is uh, increasing. Uh, there are, in some cases, uh, significant environmental impacts of what we're doing. We need to understand them and be able to mitigate them, avoid them. We're experiencing a high load growth. We have to maintain this extraordinary reliability, we believe, uh, the, the importance of reliable electric service. We heard about this in the, uh, uh, with a manufacturer that decided to, to uh, uh, go to Germany for more reliable service. I would suggest he could have come to New York if that's where he wanted to locate his business. Uh, we've got a very high cost to build our facility, facilities with, very, with a low utilization, and uh, we are not at, in, our cousin, in our present configuration, uh, very uh, hospitable to, uh, to distributed resources. It's difficult to connect up generators and storage devices. We need to accommodate them much more flexibly and integrate them into our planning and system. Uh, this is a projection that we see uh, going forward uh, of uh, what the uh, peak for, uh, demand is going to be. I'd like to point to the first uh, bar, the uh, this year uh, that we broke uh, 13,000 megawatts in uh, uh, power distributed on a peak day in, uh, in New York City and Westchester. Uh, five years ago, we projected that we would hit 13,000 megawatts in 2012. So in the time frame that we would have uh, built our, our uh, construction program around, which was projections that were made about five years ago, because that's about how long it takes to build all this stuff, we would have been seven years wrong in a 12-year projection. Not very good. What's happening here? What is, what is this story telling us? We do not understand what our customers, what you are doing with the product we supply. Do you go out and buy is it on your shopping list to buy 150,000 BTUs tomorrow or 10 kilowatt hours? No. That might be what you use, but that's not, what you're, that's not the, the transaction you're making. What are you doing? You are deciding that you want comfort, that you want security, that you want information, that you want technology, that you want health. And increasingly, those choices mean 
power, and the power is increasingly in the form of electricity. So that uh, I was speaking to a group of students uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I had calculated that it cost about uh, a, uh, a mill is a thousandth of a dollar, a tenth of a penny. It cost about a tenth of a mill to a hundredth of a mill to play a, a song on an iPod. If it cost twice that, or three times that, would you still listen to that song? And the universal answer was yes. So the value that they perceive of that song doesn't include in, the equa in its equation the cost of the product of electricity. Electricity isn't what they're buying. So when we think about the economy that we're trying to, to, uh, to uh, meet or the future that we're trying to meet, it has nothing, people, it has nothing to do with electricity. It has to do with the basic fundamental needs or wants. And these are effectively are not, in many cases, discretionary. And not in terms of the modern society that we've achieved and that people are around the world are aspiring to. So we need to do a lot of work in understanding this. This, this projection, this is our latest projection, our best thinking. We've included even some new uh, efficiencies and items. It's in there. It's all in there. It's probably wrong. And probably wrong by a lot. And as I've been mentioning, the, the future, what is, what is happening in this future? Uh, that, that vision of the car plugged into the wall outlet, transportation, uh, both personal and public transportation, is, is transforming into electric. There will be choices. It won't only be gas, gasoline, uh, for, the, for uh, personal transportation. There will be choices of electric tr uh, personal transportation that will be powered both from some sort of fuel that will be carried on board plus connected to the grid and the idea of the automobile also being a source of power into the grid. Uh, so that's, that's definitely, in our view, something that, that, that's important to, to watch. Uh, environmental mitigation and seeing the environment improve in our lifetime is, ab is absolutely needed and it's absolutely achievable. Uh, one of the fundamental uh, functions of, of, uh, uh, and, uh, of, and needs of, of, our, of all of us is clean drinking water. And that's been achieved primarily probably by one of the greatest inventions of all time of the use of chlorine for disinfection. But now that is being replaced by ozone and, and ultraviolet electrotechnologies that are cleaner, have less uh, uh, environmental impacts, even heating. Uh, there are technologies that will be much, much more, and that's a basic need in terms of comfort. Uh, the reason the people in, in India dive indoor air pollution is they're sealing the house up because it's cold. <clears throat> so these are the kinds of, of uh, uh, operational considerations we were considering. Uh, in terms of this future system that we're trying to envision. And this is a, a work in progress. Uh, we're, we're looking to find ways that we can improve the equipment utilization. We need to maintain this extraordinary uh, level of reliability and, and of, of what, as part of what we call our customer service. We need to increase our ability to operate flexibly. We need to uh, lower our costs. Uh, we need to minimize the impact on a community. Um, the the uh, project, this, this project started about a year ago uh, in, in its uh, current form. Uh, we're working closely with the uh, power company in London, in Paris, uh, in um, Tokyo, uh, Kansai, uh, uh, Commonwealth Edison, and a number of others. Uh, we've uh, committed significant resources in terms of internal efforts to, to, uh, and people to, uh, uh, to deploy this. Our, our um, investment in infrastructure has not been typical. 
Uh, we've spent between f uh, just our own company, one company, uh, we've spent uh, o over o over a billion dollars this year in capital investment in our uh, distribution and transmission systems. Uh, we're projecting this, uh, uh, what we're going to be talking about now, uh, is an investment plan of, uh, in current dollars of about $15 billion. Uh, what, we're, what we've learned in our international benchmarking are various ideas and ways that systems can be reconfigured. Uh, we've uh, seen some examples of automation and, and uh, self-healing and work that various uh, uh, electric uh, distribution and transmission companies are, are uh, working on and doing. Uh, we've seen some ideas on, on how to uh, be more compatible with the urban environment in compact physical designs. We've seen ways of minimizing the, the, the uh, incredible network of wires that are necessary uh, to supply the power to the customer or secondary. Uh, we've seen some work, especially in dense urban environments, in, in uh, new kinds of fire-resistant insulating materials. I hope this is giving you some ideas also about the kinds of nano materials and technologies that, that can uh, uh, and properties that might be of interest to this kind of an industry. Uh, we've, we've seen ways of, of multi-use for properties, being able to build uh, underground and uh, with overbuilt, and the use of utility tunnels, and we'll describe what some of these things are. Uh, this is uh, uh, a, uh, an example of some underground and overbuilt facilities. Uh, the uh, uh, the Leicester Square, uh, if, and you may even be familiar with that building, uh, that uh, building is a ticket kiosk in Le Leicester Square. And uh, if you look at the, the sketch below, you see uh, the, that small building and then this huge structure underneath. It's really the top of a, of a substation. And the substation has all of its uh, transforming equipment uh, contained in it. That little door, there's one little door on the side that, that's actually the door into the substation. I'm not supposed to, well, this, <laughs> uh, but the substation I particularly like and the one that we're working on uh, to, uh, um, uh, to, to see how we can use is the, the uh, uh, one in Orens in Spain. And that's an overbuilt substation. What it is, is completely covered in this soil in a very lovely park and you could see this, the little figure, the person walking uh, alongside. And that's a waterfall that you see. And that waterfall, the electrical equipment is water cooled. And that waterfall dissipates the heat as well as the noise mitigates any of the s sound that, that might be coming out of the, the uh, substation. That would be something I would like in my neighborhood even. So that's something that, that would be very compatible. Uh, these are utility tunnels and some examples from uh, Japan and, uh, and England. Uh, in, in, uh, in Japan, the transportation authorities uh, require uh, the public utilities to participate in a, a utility tunnel that they build along with any major transportation project. So you see that structure above the tunnel with the four compartments, water, wastewater, communications, gas, electricity, are in their individual compartments. And that ability to not have to dig up the streets more than the one time when you're doing this stuff initially, and being able to service this stuff and get access really greatly facilitates this. In London, uh, you could kind of see a person way in the distance and that tunnel is, is a, an example of the kind of, of facilities they have uh, in London. We're talking to the officials in New York City and uh, some of the various agencies that, that build uh, transportation infrastructure and water infrastructure. And what's encouraging in our conversations is that when we start to describe this thinking process that we went through, they all think that was their idea too. So I think this may happen I believe the time is right, uh, that this makes a lot of sense, and uh, this is, that it's not all doom and gloom. Now, 
Um, as we mentioned, the Technology Alliance, uh, we have um, an internal R&D program. And I stand before you, uh, we manage uh, the largest R&D program in the country, larger than the federal government's R&D program for T&D. Pathetic. That's not a very good statement. Uh, our program is going to be about $18 million next year. I think in my last conversations, Jimmy, with some of the people at, at, in your shop, they were talking about seven or eight million. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of uh, of that the, the funding is grossly inadequate. We're we're one of the we're one of the last of the private utilities to, that our, our management has has been very supportive of R and D and even in very difficult times has maintained us. Uh, has has seen this as a a critical part of their operation. Uh, we're, we're involved in almost every major decision process, planning process. We make a difference. We're also uh, uh, looking at a different model. Uh, we're in a position now where we're speaking to, to certain potential developers and manufacturers and if we could develop a, a practical concept to uh, make some of the things we, we want to happen happen, we will, uh, we're trying to, we haven't done one of these yet, but we're trying to fi find a model where we would place a commercial order for this equipment in the, for delivery in the year 2011. To give you a, a time frame for when this system of the future is going to be implemented, it's the design, the one after next. It's happening now. The one that's on the drawing boards, the, the substations we're building now, those are the last of the ones we're going to be building, like that. This, our version of a 3G system, our third generation, is starting the next one. And incrementally, we do, we've started them, as I mentioned, actually, the very beginnings of it started uh, this past summer. We're serious. I'd like to uh, show you some of these concepts. I don't know how familiar you, uh, you folks are uh, with, with power distribution and transmission, but I'm going to try to do this justice so that it's understandable. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some ideas in creating a virtual substation. That's the, the, the uh, most unintrusive uh, uh, one of all because it, it really doesn't exist. Uh, at least not in, in, any, in, in the uh, current kind of form or any certain clause. And we'll talk about something called compact networks. And these are places, these are kind of like mini grids. And these are places where uh, storage and, and um, uh, distributed uh, generation would feel most at home, but they could also uh, be included in our substation designs as well. Just a quick um, kind of a one-liner of, of uh, how we um, uh, supply power now. Essentially, uh, w uh, the transmission, the bulk power system is interlaced and reconfigurable to some extent. And ultimately, that 138 kV goes into what we call these area substations. And from the area substations outward, these networks that are created are totally isolated and can't be connected. And the concept of that was really so that if problems develop or if there are situations, so that these things become very localized. And then, at, and then after the event, there are networks that can be reconfigured to, to restore the network that, that went out. And in fact, that kind of, uh, and, and it, it had never happened until 9-11. And when those uh, towers collapsed, they collapsed on two of our substations, two of them. And the way we were able to get at least some of that, uh, and the, the city didn't go black. You know, we heard about this, about just obviously the area uh, that was directly impacted, but the city didn't go black because of this design. Uh, but, and then the, the, the way that we were able to restore the, the lower Manhattan, that area, 
uh, so quickly. And in, in we had the stock exchange. Actually, we were ready by Thursday in about three days. Uh, but we had the, the, that whole area substantially back within about two weeks, a little over two weeks, was because we were able to bring power from neighboring networks and reestablish a grid. This is what we're going to be proposing to do. And essentially, uh, a lot of this, there are no systems yet that can do this. It's a little bit confusing, so I'm going to try to. But what, essentially, what we're going to be doing is intertying at our 13.8 kV or primary uh, voltage level uh, and having switchability between networks. The, the, I, the networks will operate uh, isolated with those interconnecting breakers open normally, but they will be able to be reconfigured in the case of either equipment failure or as we described in, in the, uh, where, uh, where we lose a, a whole substation or two. Uh, here's, um, I, I'm not gonna, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna present kind of all the various switching uh, configurations, unless there's a crying need to, uh, but it, it j just the concept of, of being able to do this. And what we're doing, in order to do this, what we're what we're um, replacing is a lot of heavy iron with silicon and smarts. So that uh, there's, a, you know, in orders of magnitude, uh, the, uh, the current SCADA, and we have substantial amount of SCADA in these networks, sensing and, and the very monitoring equipment, is uh, on the order of, for some of these networks, on the order of $500,000 worth of equipment. We're estimating the intelligence that would be needed in terms of capital investment for intelligence for the new system would be on the order of four million, like an eight to eight fold increase. So by having this additional intelligence plus a lot of equipment that could be uh, operable, I'll give you an idea. Now, here's a, a real situation that we're looking at to a first kind of design concept that we're looking at to really uh, deploy this. There's an area in Manhattan on the west side uh, called, uh, that's being called Hudson Yards. It's in the, uh, along the Hudson River uh, in the 30s to the 40s. And uh, about, I think it's about 19 acres, or nine acres, nine acres. Um, and the, the uh, current load, it's, it's, it's light industrial right now, and uh, railroads is, uh, is uh, about 80 megawatts, and the projected load when that site is fully developed is about 400 megawatts. So for all intents and purposes, we can consider that a green field. It's a place where we could deploy these concepts. There's no reason to have to deal with, with existing uh, infrastructure. And this idea of creating a virtual substation where we would uh, utilize some of the overbuilt assets that we have in neighboring substations and interconnect them to supply the power is this first test of this concept. It's kind of simple. But the switching to do this and the technology involved and the ability to get this, to locate this underground and at these substations face some major cha challenges. Many of those challenges have to do with heat dissipation, have to do with size, and the idea of creating materials that could uh, 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 be options for these kinds of, of interconnections uh, would be very valuable. And obviously in that mix, potentially we might be using superconductors. Uh, this this uh, design concept actually not only utilizes these assets that are uh, or, already built to supply this, but they also, because of the diversity of where the, uh, from the bulk system these particular substations receive their power, they can, it actually adds another level of redundancy of reliability. So in this case, it's cheaper, it's, it's uh, less intrusive in terms of the community, better utilization, and we think it's, it potentially uh, might even be incrementally more reliable. Uh, we see that ultimately what might be required in the full build out when we're at the year 2025 is rather than having a five bank transformer station, we'd have a two bank transformer station. We're calling these vest pocket substations things that could be built in much smaller spaces, much less intrusive, much more compatible. This isn't a slam dunk. 
This isn't something that could be done literally with technologies that are off the shelf. Here I differ a little bit. It's the technologies, it, when you start looking at what's involved to really deploy this in a commercial, robust, viable, real world, uh, the bits and pieces bring you to a, some point, but the, to, br to really make this happen, we still have to deal with things like phase angle differences between some of these and, and how we're going to manage that. We think these are all solvable. The reason I'm putting it up is not because these are stop show stoppers. It's because these are, these are problems we have to work on. Uh, some new kinds of fast switching. Uh, we have to be able to uh, fit more equipment into existing substations while continuing their operation. We, we, because of, of the, the, the uh, uh, additional intelligence, we need to upgrade very significantly. We think this is a very important part of, of uh, our ability to model. And uh, the key is to maintain reliability and to, uh, to uh, uh, reduce congestion. Uh, this is an example of the compact network. What I'd offer or what I'd want to point out on this slide is see those black lines? See a lot of them go away? That's the difference between uh, the, being able to build to this new kind of design configuration with, with, configure, with, uh, uh, with additional intelligence and switching. And obviously with less equipment and less things in the ground, it's lower cost. And the first implementation started this summer with inspections and designs and uh, will be hopefully built over the next two years. Um, the load growth that we see and the implications of how to accommodate this is the, re the challenge. In the next 30 years, it took us 100 years to build a system to the point where we're seeing now. In the next 30 years, we see half of that again needing to be done more. And, we, we're, and I, as I said, I think we're way low. Uh, this is a, 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 a plot of, of how the deployment of this technology uh, would be done, uh, first comparing it to the conventional approach of building substations and networks, and then the savings and the ability to postpone major investments until uh, uh, well beyond 2010. So what we see is achieving revolutionary results with evolutionary uh, uh, steps. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of being uh, cautious and prudent. Uh, we are providing a vital service to a very important area, and, uh, uh, but we are uh, 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 committed to, uh, to doing this and to doing this in a smart, intelligent way. So, uh, any questions? My, qu my question is, <clears throat> your, your, your thinking is, is not conventional to that of most utilities, quite frankly, and I applaud you for that. Um, and, and in my mind, that is where utilities make more money the more they put in their rate base. Yes. So how do you make the economics work where you're putting less in your rate base yes. and still satisfy your management yes. and your shareholders? Yes. Uh, this is not just revolutionary with technology. One of those tasks is regulatory. We need to educate our regulators. We need to build a different financial model. We need to build the different rate-based structures. This is not just about switches. And uh, the and we, this the, originally this whole program was an R&D program. I was responsible for. Our chairman gave me this job. Uh, it was a, a big fanfare. And after a year of going through this process and spending a bit of money. We came, I had the, uh, the, the difficult job of going back to, to my boss and telling him it's not my job. That this job is really not about only technology. It's about the entire corporate structure and the whole business structure. And we need to change the, the, the thinking process of how we're going to, what it's going to take to achieve this. You're right, we're told, I don't know, this is the only utility I know, so it, it is typical. But uh, uh, I appreciate what you're saying, and we've heard that feedback from a number of people. But I think it's just that we're facing this challenge first. I think this is a bellwether. This is not, gonna, this is not just Con Ed. It's not just us. I think the, gov the government policy needs to be a, a key part of this. 
I think the leadership, though, will come from the industry because there is no other choice. That was the point at the opening. We have an absolute compelling reason to do this. We are obligated to serve. We have a social mission. We have a mission to the society, besides a business. Um, is there, yes? Uh, Dave, Chris Well. Uh, back in the either early or mid 90s, I saw an American scientist paper by uh, Jesse Allball, I think is what his name is, or Asball. And he pointed out that Manhattan had the greatest energy density per square meter of any city, any place on earth, really. That's correct. Uh, and I think he was saying something like 20, maybe 30 watts per square meter uh, averaged over Manhattan, not all of New York. Uh, when, when do physical limits come in? Um, they're, they're coming in. Uh, the physical limits, as you saw, are really uh, that we're hitting up against is literally the space, the interference with facilities. There's another increment that would be available with superconductivity. Uh, there's also, through smart architecture, through the change of, in, in some of the nitty-gritty details of how we wire, you saw the amount of space we were able to recover. It was actually, there's 85% less secondary when you saw those two slides flash. So I, I think it, it, it will come into, but it's not yet. That's not the limitation. Uh, the limitation is, is uh, uh, because we, there are solutions. I'm, I'm much more optimistic. Um, and I think that, that this is, is achievable. Um, there are challenges, obviously, in supply and being able to generate all that and being able to, to sustain that. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing a number on what you think the maximum power density of a city is. Okay. Can get. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I think we need to move on, Art. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, next up is uh, Roger Anderson. Uh, grid intelligence, nano computers and sensors, and Rick Smalley's vision of energy abundance for all. It's a splendid to follow Artie and uh, try to talk a little bit about the uh, detail of the computational environment that uh, will be required. I believe this is another of Rick Smalley's legacies, by the way, and so uh, I'm very pleased to uh, honor his uh, vision. Uh, he gave a speech about a year and a half ago at Columbia in which he presented this slide. Um, Columbia has its own version of this, and energy was number 10 on this list at the beginning of his presentation. By the end, it was number 4. Uh, we, we couldn't quite make ourselves put it below uh, disease and the environment and water, um, but he did make a substantial contribution even in our liberal institution. Uh, you saw quite a bit of discussion of this, so I'm going to skip over it, but I'm going to return to it in, in, at the end of the presentation uh, when we get to talking about how to practically uh, institute these kinds of visions. The real problem that uh, I like to uh, coach this in is uh, how to build the energy Internet. It's, of course, not a very uh, good analogy when you look at the detail, but there are real interesting similarities that, uh, that are critically important to get into the system. Number one on the list is flexibility. The energy grid is, uh, the electric grid is too rigid and brittle. It does not have routers, if any of you are uh, internet nuts. These, these internet-like routers are required to distribute load uh, as it moves around in a place like New York City. Um, and you just can't do it with the present arrangement where the electricity all sloshes around and runs downhill. Uh, it needs internet-like controlled failure capabilities. Right now, anything goes wrong, the grid shuts down, and we start it back up again. The entire northeastern United States went black only a year and a half ago, and not one single component burned out. There was no damage done to the physical infrastructure of the grid. Uh, that's not very smart, uh, I, I ca I, I'd like to argue. The reason it's not very smart is 
Uh, we suffered about $100 billion worth of economic damage to the country, and uh, we could have uh, paid for a few replacements of, of hardware and equipment uh, to keep from losing all of that economic money. Now, the system itself uh, is overbuilt, as, as Artie uh, gave beautiful examples of. The other thing that's happening is that the use of electricity is dramatically changing. Um, the uh, picture on the right here is what Artie was talking about of the, the actual consumption of a couple of neighborhoods in, the, in New York City versus the over-design of the various components of the grid. There's plenty of wire in the ground. Uh, I think, uh, again, Artie likes to say that New York City has the world's largest copper deposit underground, period. <laughs> well, the things that are changing, though, are, are causing us to max out, not, uh, not just be able to take advantage of this underbuilding. Uh, the cyclicity that used to happen between night and day in the electric grid is damping out. This last summer, we set a record for electricity consumption in New York, uh, but we also set, set a record uh, for the minimum trough that it fell to at nights. Nighttime consumption is flattening out this sine wave. What that means to an electric grid is it does not have time to cool off at night. The reliability uh, may go up, it may go down, but what we can certainly say is it will be different. Okay, let's talk about what has to be done in, the, in my world, the computer world as opposed to our, or in addition to Artie's world, which is the real world. <laughs> you have to be able to move load around. You have to do that with smarts because if you screw up, you black out big areas of neighborhoods just because you threw the wrong switch. It, it needs to be designed for the customer. It's, it's a market model after all. You're delivering a commodity that people are using. It has to be secure, we all know that. Um, I have an int interesting bullet in here I want to show you a, a little bit about. Uh, it has to have an overlay of what we call machine learning. What does that mean? That means that the computer learns the electricity g game as it's changing and wins every time. It's like the computer learning how to play chess. We have to provide feedback loops within the computational system that allows us to understand how the system is changing out from under us uh, so that we can keep the lights on. The big problem with it is we have to be able to understand how to go from the as-is situation of today to what we call the to-be situation of the future. I already showed you an excellent example of a third generation grid, but we don't yet understand how, how to transition from the second generation grid to the third generation grid without blacking out a whole bunch of people. We simply cannot turn the lights off do the work for a few weeks and then turn them back on. Unacceptable solution. In fact, in the United States, we can't even blink. In Europe, they allow blinking. We don't even allow that. And then the question of scalability. We have to be able to, to build this out and not run into physical limits. Here's an example uh, of some of those physical limits. Uh, the system itself is extremely complicated. The underground system in New York, in New York for what are, what's called the primary grid is controlled by a whole, whole lot of physical de devices, everything from switches to different kinds of wire insulated cable uh, to transformers uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, events that happen on the grid. And we've been trying to build an infrastructure that allows uh, the system to, uh, to shift from its reactive means uh, of maintaining itself right now, where a, a, a piece of the a component of the system will go out, uh, to one in which we can pre predict the outages so that we can fix things before they break. This is basically the Boeing airplane calling home and telling you that its landing gear is broken. We need the electric grid to be able to call home and tell its operators that something is about to break. Now, that may sound absurd to you, but we've been working with Con Ed now for a couple of years to work on this. And uh, last summer was a great, a great example. All of these yellow bars here are heat criteria days, days in which three or four, four days in a row you had really hot weather. The um, 
machine learning that our computer is tr trying to do is variously successful. We have several different models we're trying, and this number 0.5 is the performance of our models in predicting events before they happen. Random is about, random is 50%. You, you predict some, you don't predict others. Uh, sometimes during last summer, we were getting up to 80% predictability. What that means is of the 10 most susceptible wire cables to future failure during one of these heat episodes, we were able to predict in advance the eight that would go out. Now, when you have a system that you understand well enough to be able to predict its performance, only then can you truly com control it. That's what the smart grid is really about. It's about a real system with actions and observations and an understanding of the system so that you can simulate it and run thousands and thousands of scenarios for outcomes. How do you think the computer plays chess? It plays chess by playing it over and over and over again and remembering every single time it loses. You have to build an electric grid of the future that doesn't lose in the real world. It only loses in the simulated world. How do you do that? This is a very complicated problem. Um, actually, the great question a minute ago was about the center component of it. And I'll just start there. How do you optimize the business? You have to be able to keep the people who make uh, the money uh, in business enough to pay their shareholders, which are usually um, people like my grandmother who's owned Con Ed stock for 45 or 50 years. You have to do that without dynamically disrupting the reliability of the system. You can't have the lights go out. And you have to be able to fix it when it breaks, particularly now in this terrorist world where number one target on all terrorist lists is infrastructure. It is just unbelievable that a hurricane could have shown us the devastation that a breaching a levee could cause without us having simulated that outcome thousands and thousands of times. Uh, it's, uh, it's just beyond belief. Okay, how do you do all of this? You have to have a, a, a computer management system for the electric grid over and above anything that you've got, say, managing your car or managing your airplane. Why is that? Because the electrons go at just a couple of orders of magnitude slower than the speed of light. Electricity causes things to happen quickly, and an intelligent grid cannot depend on human intervention. It just happens too quickly. The smart grid has got to be able to deal in a, in a, in a reliable management structure that is computer controlled o over and above any other industry. Nano has a tremendous upside potential in this kind of world. I'll try to show you a little bit about this. This is Rick's slide. He was really on to this problem. You have to have resilience. You don't make a system that doesn't break, but you make a system that tells you before it breaks. Everything from supercapacitors to super batteries uh, to uh, smart paints to distribution of the, of the uh, of storage out to the customer, all of these things were in Rick's vision. Same old chemistry but these organic molecules conduct electricity. The concept of having continent-wide uh, Buckminster Fuller kind of connectivity of the electric grid will be a reality, and it will be caused by innovations coming out of places like Rice, these things called quantum wires. Already we're doing a pretty good job of migrating to being able to carry more electricity over the current infrastructure, but what we really need to be able to do is to optimize the entire system. What, we, what I call the electric economy, and I really believe that the, of, of all of the electric economy, the hydrogen component of it is the most speculative. My guess 
the airplanes will fly with hydrogen rocket engines across continents. Uh, but the things that certainly will happen are the electrical side of this, uh, this innovation. Fuel cells, wind, solar, bio, cogen, hydro, tidal, all of these require smart uh, computational management. Um, favorite pictures that you've already seen about superconductors, the one that I uh, want you to understand particularly if you think about this from an internet kind of world uh, of routers and of controlling failures, is this strange thing called fault current limiter. The things that you need on the grid are, th are, are physical pieces of hardware that absorb uh, uh, ch changes that happen in the grid without shutting it down. Superconductors definitely play a big game in that, a big role in that game. The smart grid is going to be centered on end-use efficiency. The customer always wins in this new world, and the d distribution of computing will be out there. It won't be at central control centers. Well, why would I say that? Because all of the electric grid operations are centrally controlled. You just can't have a system that's, that's self-healing if you can't get the, the detectors and the action and the reaction out at the grid locations where the problem is, is occurring. Distributed computing, what we call pub-sub, publish-subscribe, the capability of a gadget or widget out in the field detecting a flaw in its own performance, and instead of calling home, only calling its neighbors and asking for help. The neighbors can supply help if you have things like routers and, and fault current limiters. It doesn't do you much good to call a 1,000 a thousand miles away to home to some central location where the guy has to pick up a telephone and decide what to do. It just won't, it just won't be occurring in the future. Great example is wind and solar. And again, Rick was all over this problem. The wind blows at erratic times. Texas is a real leader in this. You have a very large amount of wind power in West Texas that you cannot use. You have several gigawatts, several thousand megawatts of wind already built out in West Texas and nowhere to put it. Nowhere to put it because you don't have the storage facilities to store it when the wind stops blowing and the capability of delivering it to Dallas and Houston and San Antonio when they actually need the power. Wind security, of course, is an overriding concern. A distributed system is inherently more safe than a centrally controlled system. And uh, I'll just leave it with that comment. Here's a great example of New York City's specific problems about moving load around. Uh, th this is the little transmission grid for the city. What you uh, probably also know is that uh, people go to Manhattan for work, and then they go home uh, to our equivalent of the suburbs, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, Staten Island, in the evening. What does that mean to a metropolitan area? The load stays severe, it just moves from here to here. You have to be able to transport that load through what are called load pockets or difficult uh, choke points in the distribution grid to get that power from one place to the other, to another. In uh, electric speak, this is the distribution <laughs> grid where all those brown guys are substations that are having trouble delivering the power to their neighborhoods during this transition. Does anybody know what this map is? Come on, somebody has to know what that map is. It's the subway system. Why would that be relevant? It's tunneled already. The uh, utility conduits that Artie was talking about for London and Paris and Tokyo, where do they put all that wire? In the, util in the utility tunnels, they put them in the subway system. New York City has a DC subway system that uses about 300 megawatts of power to run the subways. Uh, it's all DC, and it could very easily provide the conduits for the delivery of power amongst these choke points as the, as the users migrate from during the day in Manhattan uh, to the afternoon and evening in Brooklyn, Queens. 
And even that is changing because the industrialization of Brooklyn, Queens over the next 30 years is going to be astounding. And then after all of that, you've got a city that has the lowest outage rate of any metropolitan city in the world. Um, I believe that's true. Artie won't brag about it, but he, he, he couches it with the United States. But I believe it is in the world. And, and you have to be able to keep that reliability because that is the su secret sauce of New York City. Why didn't all of these corporations move out after 9-11? Why do they stay in Manhattan? Why do they stay in the center of, uh, of terrorist targets in the world? Because the power system there is an order of magnitude more reliable than in any other city in the world. That's why they stay. Now, customers are a favorite because in the present grids, we don't have a very good understanding of what the customer's actually doing with the power. It's a very, very surprising statement for a computer guy because usually you start by trying to build something that the customer is going to use. The Wall Street Journal, uh, or was it the New York Times on Sunday, had this wonderful article about server farms consuming massive amounts of electricity. Well, you need to know that if you're a, if you're a utility because you've got to deliver that electricity, no, no questions asked. In order to do that, you have to have uh, uh, smarts. You have to have the automated metering, the smart intelligence at the consumer so that you can understand the changes in habits. And believe me, they're happening faster than you can snap your fingers in order to be able to respond to them with an infrastructure where you cannot put more copper in the ground. That results in savings for everybody. <laughs> it's strange but true. Presently, the cost to customers, whatever it is, let's give it 100%. If you spend maybe 10 or 15% of your capital on an operational budget on increasing the smarts of this system, what do you do with the cost to the customer? Believe it or not, you drop it by 20 or 30%. That's hard to understand to a utility, perhaps, asking the question of how do you make money, but this is the value proposition of the Lexus. This is the value proposition of the 787. You build a faster, smarter, cheaper plane, and you sell a lot of them. What is this going to do when electricity is 30% cheaper than it is today? I hate to tell you, but you're just going to use more of it. It's like Houston building more freeways. Actually, that's a pretty good place to stop. How am I doing on my time? I'll, I'll be happy to answer a couple questions. And that message I'd like to stop on. Yeah, right back there. <clears throat> I'd like to return to that internet routing as an example. In the last few years, it's become more nonlinear, boarding on chaos as the complexity of the system grows. And I'm sure you're familiar with He's talking with about that. the internet now, not the electric grid. Well, is it possible that the electric grid would show similar characteristics? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. So, is this an easy problem? No. Is it a hard problem? Yes. It's a nonlinear problem for sure, which means you get cascading failures that escalate in severity. Uh, but doing it without routers would be impossible. Uh, if you uh, think the Internet is bad, the electric grid is at, at high risk because it's all connected to itself. Our ba basic defense mechanisms have to do with something called islanding, right? Islanding to an Internet guy would be a disaster. <coughs> that says, I can't get my email to New York City. Well, how do you get it there now? You break it into 20 parts, you send it 20 different directions, and it all comes back together at the other location. 16 of them may be, 16 of those routes may be broken. Now, does that say the Internet is a wonderful solution? No, it doesn't. The Internet is just a, a more complex machine right now than the electric grid. The electric grid won the contest for the best designed machine from the last century. It would not win it for this century. How many of those windmills are built out? Is that, is 
that just a source or is it? I got the picture right here. You can see the whole talk on the web, but this is Texas wet, wind power in, in West Texas is, has got, uh, they're producing about 700 um, megawatts right now today as we speak, and they have a capacity of about 3,000 megawatts, maybe a little less than that. The problem is transmission lines, getting the power to the right place. There's a big north, south, east, west congestion square or X in the middle of Texas. Uh, there is no capability presently to deliver it to your southern cities. All that power is going to Dallas. Dallas likes it, but getting it to Houston, San Antonio, and Austin is difficult. Um, another great, great place for getting power, getting power to the south is the offshore Gulf of Mexico. Why do you bring oil and gas to the surface, send it to shore, put it in a power plant, make it into electrons in Houston. Why do you do that? Why don't you make it uh, on the oil platform? Or even better yet, why don't you leave it in the ground and make it electrons down in the ground and bring it out? Anyway, Texas is a good, solid, advanced state in, this, in, the, in these regards. I, I don't want to put it down. They have the biggest wind capacity in the United States. They're just not able to use it. But if you put this uh, wind in New York, we'd be doing an even worse job than Texas is. Uh, I have a Rick Smalley slide that follows this, and I'll quit. And this is his, actually directly his. And I fantasized about his connection from the, from the hospital. As we read down this, I added two words or three words to it. We know we have to do this revolution in energy. That's directly from Rick. What are we waiting for? Directly from Rick. We're waiting for an energy crisis, global warming disaster or two. We certainly had a couple of big hurricanes, a new administration, an Asian technology boom. All these things are happening. Or the consensus in the science and technology establishment, plus the Department of Defense, plus Washington, D.C. in general, plus all your state leaderships, and then he would type to us from his bed, hello reality, forget about it. We have to do it ourselves. We the states, we the cities, the federal government is not going to fix this problem. Thank you. Okay, that closes our morning uh, keynote session, and I'll uh, reintroduce Amy Jaffe, who will pick us up from there. Okay, well, uh, we've kind of gotten a little bit of an overview of uh, what's out there and uh, what the benefits would be, and so our next session is going to talk about, uh, starting on Roger's uh, pessimistic note about whether our federal government can do it, but anyway, uh, our next session is going to look at uh, what kind of policy frameworks uh, we need to bring the sort of smart grid or innovation to the net uh, electricity grid uh, to fruition. So I'm going to invite our uh, policy panelists to come up to the uh, table. So now each, each of our panelists is going to uh, make about a 15-minute presentation. Um, and then we'll have some discussion among themselves, uh, and then we'll open the floor for questions. We're going to start with the Peter Hartley's first. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try to pick up on a few of the themes uh, that we've uh, heard of this morning. First one was uh, the comparison of telecommunications with electricity. And uh, the key point from that, I believe, is that it illustrates the importance of having a competitive system. I know that deregulation of the electricity industry to some extent has gotten a bad name following California, but uh, it needs to happen. Uh, and uh, if we're going to get uh, more of this innovation in, in, the, uh, in the electricity industry like we have in, in telecommunications. Uh, so, uh, so that was uh, the, the first point. Um, the second point is that uh, we, we uh, actually, for at least 25 years, economists have been talking about deregulated electricity electrical system, and uh, part of the original vision was um, smart grids and some of the things we've been talking about, but we haven't seen it happen, so uh, uh, why not? 
and I want to talk a little bit about some of that, that suggests some reasons. Uh, the third thing, but just picking up on the point that was just made, uh, is there a role for the federal government in this? And um, uh, I think there is, and that will bring me to uh, the electricity bill that we just had, the energy bill. And of course, everyone knows the energy bill had a lot of pork in it, and uh, <laughs> lots of everyone has their favourite thing that's wrong with the energy bill. But there's some provisions in the uh, electricity sect sections of the bill which I think uh, certainly provide opportunities for some of what we've been talking about here, and also perhaps give us some indication of um, where we might go for. Uh, for, for making some of these technologies a reality. Okay, so uh, first thing I want to do briefly is mention some of the uh, features of the electricity part of the energy bill. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with it, a lot of the people in the room, but those of you who aren't, I think that uh, there are a lot of opportunities here for applying a lot of the technology we're talking about in the um, uh, 2005 energy bill. And uh, these are the list of some of the things that I'm going to sort of mention or highlight from the bill. So it uh, has mandatory reliability standards, uh, various changes to transmission arrangements uh, uh, sort of foreseen or proposed in the bill, including infrastructure modernization, operation improvements, and end rate reform, changes to market rules, competition, and consumer protection, uh, promotion of fuel diversity, diversity efficiency in renewable energy sources, and promotion of smart metering. And that's the main thing I wanted to focus on is the smart metering. Uh, I might skip through this, given I'm, I've only got 15 minutes, I want to spend most of my time talking about the smart metering, but uh, certainly the reliability standards, the bill manda mandates that uh, electric utilities are supposed to come up with uh, reliability standards, uh, which should provide a lot of opportunities for some of the technologies we've been talking about to make the grid more reliable. Uh, certainly also uh, the provisions for transmission modernization uh, foreseen in the bill uh, should provide opportunities for some of the new transmission technologies that have been discussed this morning. And at the bottom here, uh, notice the bill, I think some people mentioned this already, that included in the bill is uh, subsidi subsidising R&D related to transmission improvements, including new conductors, superconductors, advanced uh, composite materials, high temperature, low sag, uh, fibre optics, high capacity ceramic, a lot of things we, we've heard talked about this morning. Um, and also energy storage devices, distributed generation, uh, and so on. So uh, certainly there's, there's provisions in the bill to try to, to encourage the adoption of some of these technologies that we've discussed. Uh, also, getting back to the theme of competition, uh, the bill uh, foresees uh, the, uh, a situation where we try to promote much more competitive, uh, much more competition in the transmission system. Uh, and uh, tries to, to uh, promote uh, uh, rules, a new set of rules. And one thing I would suggest that is important for the federal government to get involved in is setting rules and standards. Uh, so that's something that uh, probably cannot be done very effectively on a very decentralised basis. We uh, really need some sort of coordination to get new uh, rules and standards. Uh, that also applies, of course, to, to uh, transmission rate reform. Uh, and in particular, too, if we're going to implement a lot of these changes to the grid, uh, we have to have some way of uh, financing those. Uh, uh, Bill mentions just and reasonable uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, promotion of competition, as I mentioned, um, including uh, provisions against uh, market manipulation, consumer privacy, slamming and cramming. Some of that, of course, came out of our experience with telecommunications. Some of it, of course, also came out of the California uh, problem. Uh, the main thing that I want to talk about, uh, however, is um, so going the other one is promoting fuel, fuel diversity. The main thing I want to talk about was smart metering. So uh, in, you see here a quote from the bill. So one thing that they specify is that not later than 18 months after the date of enactment of this paragraph, the bill was enacted in August this year, each electric utility shall offer each of its customer classes and provide individual customers upon customer request a time-based rate schedule under which the rate charged by the electric, electric utility varies during different time periods and reflects the variance, if any, in the utility's costs of generating and purchasing electricity at the wholesale level. The time-based rate sh schedule shall enable the electric consumer to manage energy use and costs through advanced metering and communications technology. So there's certainly an opening there for smart grid, some smart grid technologies we've been talking about. 
there are actually different types of time-based rate schedules. Uh, time of use pricing can be set uh, based on anticipated costs. So this would be where, for example, you might have lower rates on the weekend because there's a lower cost of, of uh, generating electricity on the weekend. Or you can also have uh, critical peak pricing to supplement time of use. So if uh, although we may have time of use pricing set on anticipated costs, if there's an unanticipated outage or something, you can also have um, uh, extra charge for those critical, critical peaks. And then, of course, the most sophisticated is real-time pricing, which could vary hourly. Uh, and as I mentioned, the bill says uh, that the, uh, the utilities have to provide a opportunity for consumers to request a time-based meter. Now, as I also mentioned, uh, when economists first started writing about deregulating the uh, electricity electric distribution system uh, about 25 years ago, uh, this idea of having uh, real-time prices, consumers see real-time prices and being able to modify their electricity demand in response to the costs of meeting their, their demands. Um, this was all envisaged uh, sort of 25 years ago. Why has it taken 25 years? And part of the story is I think that the technology has actually improved, so it's now a lot cheaper than it, to do than it would have been 25 years ago. Part of, the idea, part of the reason why some of these new technologies take some time, though, is also that the new technology is competing always against an optimised uh, older technology. So uh, sometimes, you know, that the, when the new technology comes in, you haven't completely optimised it. Uh, it, it sometimes it's difficult to compete with the, the older system, which had a lot of R&D already done on it for many, many years. But part of it, I suggest, with respect to metering, is also that the... Um, the benefits of this for an individual consumer may not be as high as we might think, and uh, that also raises an interesting policy issue. So um, what I wanted to do is to, uh, to go through this example. So oh, I've got some remarks here on why we might want to encourage time-based metering it's from an economic point of view. So if we provide consumers with cost-reflective prices, uh, it's going to allow consumers to decide whether the marginal benefits of consuming electricity at any particular time match the marginal costs, uh, so we get a more efficient uh, use of electricity. Uh, the alternative to price rationing is actually quantitative rationing, and that's actually much less efficient than rationing by prices. So in, in, if you allow prices to rise when the demand uh, increases relative to your ability to supply, the least valued demand is eliminated first, Whereas if you do quantity rationing, I mean, one reason why um, price controls in gasoline, for example, are so inefficient is that uh, someone who may have an extremely highly valued, uh, uh, extremely high valued use for the fuel can't get it. And of course, the idea, that the idea that you can't get it actually in itself raises demand in the short run. So people will rush out and keep their tanks, gasoline tanks full because they may believe that they are unable to get it. Uh, whereas with price rationing, it's a lot more efficient. Uh, also, if you had uh, time-based metering, load management can be bid in as a resource into the system to help maintain uh, system stability. And uh, there are various markets around the world where uh, that's happening. Market signals can also better guide investment decisions. So if, if utilities, again, we're getting this important part of the prices in a market is to convey information, on the one hand, from the utilities to consumers to tell them how expensive it is to supply their need, but also conveys information the other way. So a couple of people talked about that. How do the utilities find out how much electricity is worth? And so by looking at the, the amount that people are willing to pay for electricity at different times of the day, different times of the year and so on, they get a much more accurate signal of where they want to make their investments. So it brings me to the question, if this is such a wonderful thing, uh, we've had computers around for a long time, why haven't we had smart metering before now? And uh, I want to talk about what some experiments that were done in California where people were faced with real-time pricing and, um, and see how much they responded. So there was this Californian pricing uh, pilot experiment that was conducted in 2005. Uh, or the paper was in 2005. Uh, average elasticity of response to peak off-peak price differences that the, was found in the study was an uh, elasticity of minus 0.076. And the average elasticity of response to daily average price change was uh, minus 0.041. So with that information, uh, I collected some data from uh, the Californian ISO on hourly average wholesale prices 
for each hour of 2003, and the hourly demand in California in megawatts for each hour in 2003, and ask the question. So here's actually a, a graph of the price, and on the what would be the left is the load and system load in California, uh, and on the right is the Californian price. Uh, and I'm sorry, the, the labels got a little bit jumbled up. <laughs> so then what we did is imagine we have a household with, uh, has a demand profile like the average California demand, one here, but scaled back to what the uh, average household demand in California would be. And uh, let's suppose they were faced with a time price, a, a, a price that reflect, reflected this uh, time variation in, in uh, costs. As, as I um, outlined on the right-hand side picture. So this Californian price here is the wholesale price. And uh, we set the uh, time price that we're going to face the household with so that it had the actual average price that households saw in California in 2003. Uh, and uh, then I had a function that will map then the wholesale price to the retail price, this one down the bottom. So we're going to simulate the idea of having smart metering. So here you are a household with the typical demand profile that we see in California and we're going to have you actually face a retail price so you imagine you've got smart metering. What it would do to your demand. And uh, so here's a picture of, of the profile for retail prices that you'd get under that the simulation. And as I said this is, this is chosen so that the average price actually matches the average price actually paid in 2003. And uh, from this we can calculate the percentage deviation in the retail price in any given hour. And also, uh, for the sake of this argument, initially I'm going to assume no change in the overall average price. And then from the elasticities that we get from the experimental evidence, uh, that'll give us a change in electricity consumption that's minus 0.076 times the change in hourly price. And from that we can calculate a new demand. And what we find is that the demand picture would shift from the top picture on the left to the bottom picture on the left. Uh, and on the right-hand side, the little graph gives us the actual change in, in household demand if, if we were facing these households with real-time prices. And the interesting thing is about the picture on the left is that you can see that the load profile gets filled in, smoothed out a lot. And it's a lot ch uh, cheaper to, to uh, satisfy that kind of load profile than it would be the original one. So a flatter load profile, you get much better utilization of your capital resources like people have talked about. Also on the right hand picture you can see that um, the higher the demand at any hour, uh, generally speaking, so that's coefficient being negative implies that those hours when demand's higher, you tend to have a reduction in demand. Those uh, hours when demand was lower, you have an increase in demand. So that also indicates you're smoothing demand out. But if you then look at the average cost to the household for the simulated demand at these simulated prices, you find that the actual, the average cost is actually slightly higher than would be buying the original demand at a flat rate. So uh, there's the problem that uh, you, uh, the cost of the meter is, is likely at least $150, so um, at least in this simulation, uh, the change in demand is not going to offset the cost of the meter. Now, if you have a house that has central air, it turns out the elasticity is quite a bit higher. So, of course, then there would be a big, much bigger, there would be a saving. And uh, also, because of the flattening of the load curve, average costs of production should fall, so the average price would fall. So that also would be a gain. But nevertheless, I think that one of the, you know, what this suggests is that one reason why we haven't seen a greater penetration of smart meters is that for the individual household, at least, uh, it's not a, a great um, money saver right now. Now, one way we can improve things is we can have automatic response to price signals. So people have talked about that. So you put smart chips into appliances and so forth, so they respond automatically to uh, time-varying electricity prices. But uh, the other point is, I think is a very interesting one is if we look at the largest experiment to date for smart metering, it's actually been conducted in Italy. And ENEL have installed, uh, will have installed 30 million smart meters by the end of 2005. And what ENEL have found is that smart metering has brought a range of, of other benefits to the utility. 
So, for example, it's, going to, it's eliminated meter reading costs and problems with estimated inaccurate and late bills, which is actually huge savings. Uh, quickly and accurately identifies any source of network failure so that they can uh, go out and repair the line much more quickly. Uh, increased ability to identify electricity theft, which was a problem in uh, southern Italy, <laughs> I guess more particularly. Uh, information on use patterns has allowed them to better de uh, forecast demand levels and targeted their advice to households on consumer behaviour. Um, they've, it's allowed them to introduce a large menu, menu of flexible tariff structures. So a lot of Italian households now have, ta have taken up tariffs which have lower prices on the weekend. For example, they do all their washing, clothes washing and so on on the weekend when electricity is a lot cheaper. Um, and consumers, of course, can quickly switch uh, tariffs in the Italian case, but also in a competitive market switch suppliers. And, of course, the other interesting one was it permits a gradual reduction of service for delinquent customers. So one thing that uh, Enel pointed out is that uh, in the past, if someone didn't pay the bill, you only had one option, you cut them off. But what you can do with a, a smart meter is if someone hadn't paid their bill, you can reduce the electricity service a little bit. So they can watch the TV or they can wash the clothes, but they can't do both, you know, uh, until they pay their bill. So, so you can still have people, and, and actually the customers really like that, those who even have liquidity problems and so on, they've still got electricity available to them for the essential services, but uh, um, you know, uh, they also give them an incentive to pay their bill. Now, the interesting thing about a lot of these other benefits is that you notice that a lot of these benefits are system-wide benefits. They don't necessarily occur to the individual household. So to eliminate meter reading costs, you want to have a smart meter in all the households. If you've got to send the meter reading guy around to read every second or third house, you haven't really saved a lot of the costs. And uh, to quickly and accurately identify sources of network failure, you want to have a lot of these meters on the system. Um, you know, to detect electricity theft, again, you want a lot of the meters on the system. You don't just want individual households to put them in. Uh, to, and also, well, a lot of these things are, are system-wide kind of benefits, uh, which brings me to the point that you know, I think that that's an argument for having policy to coordinate trying to uh, give incentives to put these uh, sorts of smart meters in place rather than just relying on the individual household, for example, to make this one-off calculation uh, on their own. So uh, in that, I think there is a, a lesson. And the key thing is standards and rules require coordination. And, uh, and that, I think, is a key role for, for the government. So that's basically uh, the, the message of my remarks. Thank you. Thank you all. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, come speak. It's, it's, a, uh, it's comforting to me to know that a lot of the things that are in my presentation are actually things that are actually happening in companies. Coming from the government, we do lots of things, many of them not very well, but we do write reports and we write lots of them. And I will tell you that um, as we see some of the things that I'm going to talk about today in, in one of our reports, uh, it is very comforting to see that um, utilities, Con Ed. Um, I was in Phoenix last week and there were presentations by Idaho Power and DTE and others that are taking the innovation and taking it to the next level and finding ways to integrate these technologies into their grid to the benefit of their consumers. And it's, it's really great to see that our products, which is a re report really, and some R&D, are actually making a difference. Um, as you can see, my title is, uh, Can the U.S. Lead in Grid Innovation? And I'll be honest with you, I think the answer is still, I don't know yet. Um, I think we have the capacity. I think we have the, the ingenuity to do it. But I don't think we have the will across our country to take what it is necessary to really make this impact and become a world leader where everybody looks to us and says, this is the way we want to build out our new next generation transmission system. There are a number of visions out there for the future electric grid. These are a few. Um, Rick Smalley's vision, obviously one of the reasons we're here today is to talk about um, how new materials and, and new types of, of systems can, uh, built up from the molecule upwards, can actually really transform our electric power system and what it means to consumers. We have the, the 
Grid 2030, which was a DOE document that I led, um, it's not my words, um, it's really the industry's words and those who were part of the process. Um, and I'll talk mainly about that. Um, EPRI has had a vision of the future grid. Um, National Energy Technology Lab has one. Um, I added that Jesse Burst has one, which is a uh, um, very similar to some of the other ones up here. Um, and there's also one that uh, has a vision of a high capacity uh, backbone, superconducting backbone. It's called SuperGrid. Uh, it is cooled by, or the cryogenic component is hydrogen. It goes across the entire country. Uh, it's called SuperGrid. And the common theme throughout all of these, they're innovative, they're creative, but it takes a tremendous amount of R&D and capital to get us from where we are today to, to the reality of the visions of all these documents. I won't go into the, to the Smalley vision, as you've heard so many times, but I will say just a couple issues about it. Um, you can see on the left side of this document, local, 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 local. That means consumer, 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 consumer. That means we need to push to the consumer more information, more options, more technology, and it will make our grid more robust and more reliable. I think that is the centerpiece of what he really wanted, which is out of the hands of, this is not big utilities, because they will always play a very vital role. But if we can push more and more to the consumers, we will get more reliability, we'll get lower costs, we'll get more innovation. So what is Grid 2030? When we created the Office of Electric Transmission and Distribution at the Department of Energy about three years ago now, um, we didn't have a roadmap. We had a few programs that were currently in existence at the Department of Energy, but they had no common theme. And part of the goal of creating this office was to create kind of a soup to nuts, an A to Z vision of what the transmission grid and the electric power system might look like in the future. We had a few meetings. We had a lot of CEOs and and uh, major policymakers and regulators from around the country come to Washington and they helped us. And I think Jesse was actually one of our speakers there. Um, and we got to, this was my second toast, taste of his, uh, of his words, um, which are always obviously humorous. But what we did was we tried to say, without looking at your uh, bottom line, without looking at uh, your consumers, without looking at your shareholders, what would you all envision this grid will look like in, in 2030. Uh, we came up with this document and then we developed a roadmap. The document on the left, as you can see, is grid 2030. The document on the right was about six months later. What we did was we took the vision and we took every small issue and every small barrier and we tried to hash them out and develop a timeline for when we should resolve those issues in order to achieve the vision of grid 2030. So what is it? I don't think you all can really see the picture too well, and I apologize for that, but Grid 2030 was envisioned as a ultra-reliable and affordable electric backbone system across the country. It is resilient. It is a superhighway. We use this word every day in, in electricity and in, inter I'm sorry, in Internet and in uh, transportation, but we don't use it in the power system, and it actually will pro would provide great benefits. Again, here we say, as Rick Smalley did, that consumer participation can increase reliability. It absolutely can. And zero losses, that's new materials, that's superconductivity, that's diamond sensors, that's all of this silicon-based power electronics. That means that we produce less generation to achieve the same, to satisfy the same load, which means we produce less emissions. It's, it is all tied together, and that's what we try to achieve in this vision. This vision was made up, or Grid 2030 was made up of really three components, local, micro and mini grids, which incorporate distributed generation, smart meters, uh, storage, uh, maybe small power plants at a, uh, at a neighborhood or in your backyard right next to your air conditioning unit. Who knows? That's part of the innovation that we're trying to achieve uh, and spur on as we put out this vision. Those small areas and micro grids are tied to a regional interconnection, perhaps the utility. They won't go away, they will be here, and they will be a provider of reliable service for hundreds of years to come. But we have to be able to share, or it becomes uneconomic for all of us. So if, if we are overproducing at the local level, we want to be able to transfer that to a market, and it's really the transmission system of today or tomorrow that will allow that electricity to go to the next neighbor 
neighboring site, state, or interconnection. These regional interconnections are joined by high capacity conductors. Superconductivity? I don't know. Uh, new materials of the future? I don't know. But the point is to allow large transfers of bulk power across these regional interconnections to ensure that it's an efficient transfer of power. And then in a national electric backbone uh, that crosses all three of our interconnections, Texas, the West, and the East, so that we can share Pacific hydro. We can share wind in the Midwest. We can share coal in Wyoming. We could pair coal in Wyoming uh, with wind and provide a firm service to a uh, firm power product uh, to many different areas around the country. But we cannot do that today. So the question is, would this provide value? And we thought it absolutely would. You can't really see most of these words, and that wasn't the intent. The only one that I really wanted to show you was um, this one number, $3.17 billion. Um, I need to go back a little bit and say, so what is the government doing? What is our role in this? Part of our role was to provide some leadership. We had leadership at the state level. We had leadership at the regulatory body, who you'll hear from, from lunch, at lunch. Um, but we couldn't bring together an R&D vision. And at the Department of Energy, we were an R&D agency. We weren't a regulator, but we needed to promote R&D because in the industry, R&D has virtually dried up. So we wanted to be a facilitator of an idea, not the only vision, but one vision. People can latch onto parts of it or all of it. It's up to them. But let's put it out there and let's push towards the end. $3.17 billion is what we came up with would be the, the government's price for completing all of the research and development necessary to achieve this vision. That would be paired with hundreds of billions of dollars from the industry. And that's okay. That's the way it should be. The government should not drive this process. Industry should drive it. The $3.17 billion is compared to the billion dollars that we would spend anyway. So it's really about a $2 billion increase in funds, yet that is the hardest $2 billion to get our hands on and to spend the way we need to spend it. I'll get into that shortly. I'm going to go through just the components of what this envisioned. And these are, for the most part, programs at the Department of Energy within the Transmission Office. But I wanted to explain to you exactly how it really incorporates everything that we've heard today. Grid Works, it's a transmission program. It really takes technologies that are on the shelf today, high capacity conductors, maybe superconductivity, maybe composite, maybe 3M's graphite conductor, and it integrates them into the grid. One of the big problems that we found as we were developing this vision, the entire system is connected. Utilities are hesitant to put the latest technology on their grid. In fact, they don't even want it in their interconnection. They want it in the next interconnection. So how do we, how can the government help facilitate this? We identified a number of places around the, the country, specifically in TVA, where they had a very robust grid to a, a old weapons complex complex facility that was 2,000 megawatts. This was a very reinforced part of the transmission system. The load is gone. It is a perfect place to test new technologies because if something happens, nothing will happen to the system around it. Transmission program. Grid works as it was called. Grid wise is a distribution program. It is taking these smart meters. It is taking grid friendly appliances. It is taking lots of other technologies, interconnection standards and codes for all of these different appliances, and it's taking them and integrating them into the grid. It's taking a holistic view of what that could do in a region. Utilities are doing it. Some utilities are doing it. But we need to look larger. If we're going to have, if our electric transmission system is connected, then you can't just be looking in your utility. You have to be looking at your neighbors as well. So grid-wise, is intended to look across a region, figure out what are the issues that we need to resolve to integrate these types of technologies into the grid. The Pacific Northwest is far and away the best leader in this regard. Pacific Northwest Lab, Bonneville, some of the utilities are far and away pushing the envelope on integrating these technologies. Transmission reliability. This really is, it's not grid works. These are um, 
big systems um, that increase visibility, increase reliability across the interconnections. In the West, uh, after the 96 blackout in the West, uh, Pacific Northwest Lab led the creation of what was called the Wide Area Measurement System, which was a Western interconnection-wide, satellite-based system w which would um, help utilities understand voltage changes in different parts of the system. It was wide area, the entire interconnection. There's one as a result of the blackout in the east that has just got up and running. It's called the Eastern Interconnect Phaser Project. This transmission reliability program is intended to push those types of technologies that, that are not how, what you put on the grid, but how you visualize and how you see the entire grid so that if a problem happens in one area, it, will, it may not spread to other areas. High temperature superconductivity. Obviously, you heard from, from Greg Urick. Um, if it weren't for companies like American Superconductor uh, and the others in, uh, in the commercial space in the United States and actually globally, we would be much further back than we are today. DOE's HTS program has been around for almost two decades. Uh, they get about $40 million a year, uh, if that. Uh, depending upon what earmarks are coming um, towards specific programs. We are at the leading edge of HTS research, and we are at the cusp of really having this integrated into the grid. We need one more push. One more push could be two years. It could be five years. But we have to take these technologies that have been working in the lab and integrate them into the grid because we have to create the commercial markets here. That was the goal of the HTS program. Not only wires, but motors, generators, fault current limiters, their medical applications, their military applications, their telecommunications applications. It is a great technology that has widespread ability to affect positively all consumers in many different areas. This is actually kind of the saddest one, to be honest with you. The existing DOE budget for storage. Really, I think there are two holy grails of electricity. One of them is transmitting electricity without impedance, and the second one is how do you store it? If we could resolve those two issues, we would be amazing. This would be the best grid in the world. Storage has the ability to shave peaks, improve reliability, help consumers in a whole wide variety of different ways, and we, the government, spend three million dollars a year on storage. It's pretty sad. This vision would increase that to 4.9 million, not a huge leap. But what we were trying to do with those, the increase in dollars is pair them with the Department of Defense, uh, pair them with other federal agencies that have much larger budgets uh, for storage and, and leverage. And then we had utilities uh, that were very interested in storage for peak management, uh, for load management. And, again, we know some of the technologies, it's how do we get them into the grid. You saw Jesse, his slide was a whole lot more creative than mine, but um, th there's one distinguishing difference here. It's the exact same slide except for I want to point out one thing. Um, this is DOE's R&D portfolio in electric power, about $1.5 billion. 62% for generation, much of that is distributed generation. Much of it is uh, turbines, gas turbines. End use, the bulk of it is energy efficiency. Transmission and distribution is 6%, as Jesse said. The problem is if you take out that $40 million of superconductivity, it's 3%. That is where you get the most value, and that is where we need to increase the research and development dollars at the federal level. So why did we need to provide some leadership? I'm not a believer that the federal government will resolve this problem. It is not the case. But we can provide some niche leadership um, in this time of, of indecision. The industry is fragmented. We are getting more leaders in the industry. Uh, but we do not have a single vision for how markets and reliability work together. There are financial risks and uncertainties still today after Enron, after California. Liquidity in markets, it's, it's still, we're trying to get back to where we were. States all have different rules. There's a large um, dispute between the federal 
regulatory system and the state regulatory system. And this puts utilities in a very bad position and it hamstrings investment. Siting and permitting, um, that's obviously a, a challenge when it comes to transmission lines uh, and, and large power plants, nuclear or coal plants. And then utility R&D in the decline. So we thought it was important that we take a role to put the vision together. Again, we will lead an effort, but we won't pay for it. We put an idea out there for people to grasp onto, to shoot at. Let's take it and run with it and push as far as we can. Why now? Why did we think now was the important time? Not just because we created an office and we needed something to do, but the statistics showed that the system was old. This is TVA system. This, these are their transformers. 60% are over 15 years old, between 50, 15 and 25 years old. The reason why now was the time was because if they put in the same type of equipment, we would be 30 years down the road before we tried to install something new. And we couldn't allow brand new equipment, not depreciated, in the same old mechanical systems put in without striving and trying to push the envelope with something new. As I said, R&D expenditures in the industry, they're at probably the lowest levels ever, quite frankly. Um, as we see in this chart, just as a percentage of, of expenditures or as a, a percentage of revenue or net sales, um, electric power is way down at the very end. There's, somebody's got to pick up that slack. We thought, at least in the interim, it was the government. Now, this is just utility R&D. This doesn't take into consideration that by Cisco and IBM and the smart metering companies, no doubt that will increase that amount, but by no means would that come to 12% of revenues. And it should be in the top 10. There's so much room for improvement here and innovation that the more we can, the higher we can get that, the better off we'll be as consumers. I'm winding down here, so um, the barriers that I see um, and this is what I was asking earlier, you know, as utilities get paid on putting things in their rate base, it makes sense that they're going to say, no, not your way, my way. I want to be able to do it. That's what their, their shareholders are, are asking for. They've been running a reliable system for 100 years. Who are we to come in there and say that we can make it more reliable with my widget? It is a balancing act, but the fact is they make money by putting things in their rate base. One of the reasons why you don't see new transmission lines going in is because it takes a long time to put them in the rate base. When you can go to your regulators and say, it's going to take 10 years to put in this big transmission line and it'll take two years to put in this environmental controls on this coal-fired power plant, it's good for both the regulator and the utility to put the environmental controls on. It gets in the rate base quicker. The regulator can take credit for cleaning up the environment, but it doesn't do much for improving the reliability of the system. This may be strong, but consumers get nothing from installing distributed generation. As you're in a vertically integrated system, you need to be able to achieve some of the value that you're creating by either selling power back to the grid or improving reliability. There is a cost to that, and consumers should be able to gain some of that value. Maybe not all of it that they're providing, but some of it in terms of real dollars, real bill reductions, whatever. But they need to be able to get uh, some of that value. It's not easy to aggregate demand response, but it's being done mainly in the markets around this country, the wholesale power markets in New England, New York, the Midwest, PJM, and Texas. It's not really happening in many other places. Markets are critical to allowing many of these technologies to, to infiltrate into the systems. I say no leadership. Um, it's a lack of leadership, quite frankly. We've had transitions in the power industry. We have transitions in the political leadership um, at every level. This is state and federal. We don't hear anybody talking about the electric power system because they expect it to be reliable and be there. It doesn't need an advocate. We do need an advocate, and we don't have one right now. Venture capital, it's flowing to the system now. The question is, when we get some of these barriers reduced, will it still be there? It's a huge question. Um, will they continue putting money in five or six years down the road when technologies that they're funding today are not integrated into the system, when they see no markets for those technologies? And finally, educating the consumer. It's really the consumers 
that can push this much faster than any government agency, any utility executive, any educational institution. It's the consumers who get the, ba the value. It's the consumers are the ones that have to push it. So here in, uh, in my conclusion, I think the, our two visions were alike. I think a lot of them have very similar threads and components. And that's a good thing because I think in the end they all add value to consumers. So we need to continue to push forward. All of us, as Jesse said, get involved. Get rich. I like that better. But get involved. Um, that's what is going to push this forward more than anything. We're still decades away. This is not going to happen overnight. It took us 100 years to get to where we are. We cannot expect that we're going to change this in the next five years. But we need to have a plan that will transition our system over the next decade or two. Regulatory barriers must fall, state and federal. I'm not as high on the energy bill, quite frankly. I was there for a number of years when we wrote it. I think it was a huge missed opportunity. And uh, I think there are some provisions that were critical, reliability standards, but there are other things in there that could have made a very, very big difference today. As I said, consumers must get a piece of the pie. Congress must increase R&D dollars. That's in the interim. We need to push the industry, as I've said. We need to fill this gap until industry can pick up that research and development. Regional markets are critical to promote innovation, absolutely essential. Uh, and then in the end, Americans will build an innovative grid. We are the innovators. We will unleash e economic opportunity, entrepreneurialism, but we will only do that if there is a market by which they can actually sell their goods and integrate their goods into this grid. Otherwise, we'll be just like we are today, and we'll have this conference 10 years from now, and we'll be saying the exact same thing. So it's always fun, since I'm not a really good joke teller, uh, but to end on a, uh, on a cartoon, and this is basically who came first, the chicken or the egg, and that is are we going to spend more money on the grid today before we fix the regulatory barriers, or are we going to fix the regulatory barriers to allow and unleash innovation? And we are in this betwixt and between. One has to fall first for the other to really push for innovation. Thank you all.